You ready, Dimitri? Okay. <clears throat> Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janabala Ba Giri Vardhan Hari Hari Gopi Janabala Ba Giri Vardhan Hari Yashura Nandana Pajajana Ranjana Yashura Nandana Pajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravanachani Yamuna Tiravanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Om Shnupad Paramahansa Paravitakaya Charja Ashtoto Tadashi Srimad His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki Jai Iskan B.B.T. Founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Om Shnupad Paramahansa Paravitakaya Charja Ashtoto Tadashi Srimad His Divine Grace Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur Ki Jai Ananta Koti Vaishnavinda Ki Jai Nama Acharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Sri Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Okay. Now, I believe we finished the last chapter, didn't we? You weren't here. Yes, Guru. You we finished the last chapter. Okay. It is 6-1. We're in the beginning yes, of the 6 -1. Okay, thank you. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय On this 23rd day of August 2022 in San Diego, we're reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And tonight we're beginning Chapter 6, Dhyana Yoga, text number 1 on page 257. Sri Bhagavan Vacha Anashrita Karma Palam Karyam, karma, karoti yaha, sasanyasi, cha yogi cha, nanadagnir, na chakriyaha. Sri Bhagavan Vacha, anashrita karma palam, karyam karma karoti yaha, Sasanyasi cha yogi cha Nanadagni na chakriyaha Si Bhagavan Vacha Anashita karma palam Karyam karma karoti yaha Sasanyasi cha yogi cha Nanadagni na chakriyaha Shri Bhagavan Vacha Anashrita karma palam Karyam karma karoti yaha Sasanyasi cha yogi cha Nanadagni na chakriyaha Shri Bhagavan Vacha Anashita Karma Palam Karyam Karma Karoti Yaha Sasanyasi Chi Yogi Cha Nanadagni Na Chakri Yaha Okay, you want to try? Go ahead. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Anashrita karma palam Karyam karma karoti yaha Sasanyasi cha yogi cha Nanadagni na chakri yaha Okay. Shri Bhagavan Vacha, the Lord said, Anashrita, without taking shelter, karma palam, of the result of work, karyam, obligatory, karma, work, karoti, performs, yaha, one who, saha, he, sannyasi, in the renounced order, cha, also, yogi, mystic, cha, also, na, not, nihi, without, agnihi, fire, na, nor, cha, also, akriyaha, without duty. Translation. The Supreme Personality of God had said, one who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life. And he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire uh, and performs no duty. Purport. In this chapter, the Lord explains that the process of the Eightfold Yoga System is a means to control the mind and the senses. However, this is very difficult for people in general to perform, especially in the age of Kali. Although the Eightfold Yoga System is recommended in this chapter, the Lord emphasizes that the process of Karma Yoga, or acting in Krishna Consciousness, is better. Everyone acts in this world to maintain his family and their paraphernalia. But no one is working without some self-interest, some personal gratification, be it concentrated or extended. The criterion of perfection uh, is to act in Krishna Consciousness, and not with a view to enjoying the fruits of work. To act in Krishna consciousness is the duty of every living entity, because all are constitutionally parts and parcels of the Supreme. The parts of the body work for the satisfaction of the whole body. The limbs of the body do not act for self-satisfaction, but for the satisfaction of the complete whole. 
Similarly, the living entity who acts for satisfaction of the supreme whole and not for personal satisfaction is the perfect sannyasi, the perfect yogi. The sannyasis sometimes artificially think that they have become liberated from all material duties, and therefore they cease to perform Agnihotra yagas, fire sacrifices. But actually they are self-interested because their goal is to become one with the impersonal Brahman. Such a desire is greater than any material desire, but it is not without self-interest. <coughs> Similarly, the mystic yogi who practices the yoga system with half-open eyes, ceasing all material activities, desires some satisfaction for his personal self. But a person acting in Krishna consciousness works for the satisfaction of the whole, without self-interest. A Krishna conscious person has no desire for self-satisfaction. His criterion of success is the satisfaction of Krishna, and thus he is the perfect sannyasi or perfect yogi. Lord Chaitanya, the highest perfectional symbol of renunciation, prays in this way. Nadanang najanang nasundarim Kavitang va jagadish kamaye Mama jan mani jan mani shwade Bhavata bhakti rahai tu ki tvahi O oh, Almighty Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth, nor, nor enjoy beautiful women, nor do I want any number of followers. What I want only is the causeless mercy of your devotional service in my life, birth after birth. O me jnana timarandasya jnana shalakya chakshu unmilitam mena tasmai shri gurave namaha. I was born in the darkest of ignorance, but my spiritual master Srila Prabhupada opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisance to him and to all members of Sri Parampara. So there's kind of a paradox, I guess you would call it, in in the uh, philosophy here of the uh, yoga system, as, as Prabhupada is going to uh, explain it. And indeed, in the entire bhakti yoga uh, philosophy. Because here, Prabhupada makes it very clear, or the Krishna first makes it clear in the verse, one who is unattached to the fruits of his work, works as he is obligated, is, it, uh, is in the renounced order of life, he is the true mystic, not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. So, the idea, of this, it's carrying forward from the previous chapter, which is the idea of, is called uh, Nishkama Karma Yoga. Nishkama means without material desire. But doing work, but linking that work up to the Supreme by offering the fruits of the work. So this Nishkama Karma Yoga is what was discussed in the previous chapter. And one who performs it perfectly, he attains the state of Brahma Nirvana. Brahma Nirvana. Uh, means that there's no, res no reaction to your work, good or bad. Uh, the law of karma is that if you do good works for others and you do sacrifices and then you reap the result, and you can get a better birth in this world or even go to the heavenly planets. So there's a whole uh, part of the Vedas that deals with that. Mantras you should chant and things you should do, fire sacrifices, all kinds of things. But the aim is, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give off the fruits of, the, of the, my uh, labor now, I'll be, live very austerely, but in the future I'll enjoy like anything. Right? So really there is a fruit of desire there. So, Krishna consciousness is meant to be different. That's why Prabhupada quotes this famous verse from the Shikshasika, that, my dear Lord, I, 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 I'm serving you, but my, my goal is not dana, which is wealth, not jana, which is followers, not sundari, beautiful mate, or kavitam, which is uh, different things it could mean. And one thing, I mean, it's great uh, intellectual, you know, achievements in that honor, kavitam. Uh, Jagadisha, O Lord of the Universe, Kamaye. I'm not desiring any of these things. And then he says, Mama Janmani Janmani Shure. So he said, but birth after birth. And as soon as you say that, he's saying that I don't want liberation either. Because that means there's no more birth. So then what do you want? Bhavatad Bhakti Rahai Tuki Tvayi. Which means I want uh, unmotivated bhakti unto you. Loving devotional service to you. That's, that's my, my goal. I'm praying for that. You see? So, but what does that entail? 
I mean, we learn from, from uh, the Shastra that one who is situated in this, this constant flow of loving devotional service to Krishna, meaning un, unmotivated by any material or selfish means, but simply motivated by pleasing the Lord, then that, that engenders the greatest happiness, the greatest bliss, unending happiness. And there's no more birth, death, old age, and disease. So now what, so, so you, see, you see the paradox here. In other words, the greatest result you can get is, first of all, no more birth, old age, no more birth. And the other is that you're really experiencing transcendental prema bhakti ananda, prema ananda which is the greatest happiness it can be because it's not limited by time or space and it goes on forever. So what happened to the fruit, the, 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 uh, you know, what that, if that was your motivation all along, then how was it unmotivated? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so in other words, only by un, uh, un, unceasing, unmotivated, unalloyed devotional service to Krishna means you're, you're only thinking of the benefit of, of, of the Lord and his devotees and like, you're completely selfless, can you really enjoy the greatest happiness? So isn't that, isn't that selfish? In other words, <laughs> at what point does it, does, does it transfer over to the you know, selflessness? So this is, this is the, the uh, kind of inconceivable nature of bhakti, is that it, it's really a, a journey Right, we have this book, Journey of Self-Discovery. But it's also a journey in which your motivations change. You're transforming your heart. What moves you? Because the standard thing is, without any transcendental input, any of this knowledge or association, then what's going to move you? Well, the impetus is for sense gratification. You know, it can be in a wholesome way, you know, family life and doing good, good for the community and things like that. It doesn't have to be completely demonic. But it's in that uh, individual or extended self-centeredness. You know, maybe even for all humanity, which is very good. Um, and gets good karma. But it's limited to the field of your own mind, intelligence, and senses. You never really get out of that. You don't understand the, 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 anything about the, uh, the soul or the, the, the pure spirit and the pure spiritual world. None of that is real. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I have my, I'm down to earth. I'm going to live, you know. Like, and you can become a good person and get a, you know, a be, at least a, a human birth, better birth like that. So, but that's, uh, that's very much uh, circumscribed by the material limitations. The limitations of your own time, your own lifetime in this body. Whatever assets you develop in terms of family or prestige or uh, money in the bank or relatives, children, whatever, that's all, that relationship is broken at the end of life. So one who is really intelligent and he's thinking in long term. I read, I read this new philosophy that I'd never heard of before called long-termism. Is it, did anyone hear about that yet? Long-termism. And I was thinking, well, we're, we're like long-termism. You know, we're thinking of the inf infinite time. What's the final? But no, this is completely different. We're at the beginning of chapter 6? Okay. And that, it, 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 it just boggled my mind. You know, I mean, these are, these are intelligent people with college degrees and everything coming up with it. And I said, really, we have to think about the benefit of all of the, um, uh, what is it called? Artificial intelligence beings that are going to be born as te technology increases. You know, there are going to be millions and billions and even trillions of them. So we have to, we have to think of that, their benefit and, and do something now. I say, are you kidding? You know? <laughs> there's, there's no soul. I don't care how intelligent they seem to be. There's no, there's no person there. You know, they make these robots, you know. That, it's just madness. But these are serious people with serious amounts of money behind them. Elon Musk, oh, that's my philosophy. Yeah. Anyway, so back to, back to our study here. So, so here, think of what happens. When you come to, to uh, first association with devotees, you sit in a lecture or something. Prabhupada always emphasized this because he was often speaking to new people. or you know, And that is, as Krishna, as Krishna emphasizes it in the 13th chapter, one of the parts, one of the elements of real knowledge is to understand the, what we call evils or the, the, the suffering of birth, old age, disease, and death. First, understand that you're not the body, you're pure spirit. 
But when we act completely on the basis of identifying with the body, either gross or subtle, the mind also, then we're, we're ignoring the most important aspect of our being, which is the soul itself. And what is the fate? What, well, you may, you may, as I mentioned, you may live a good life, you may you know, uh, have a nice family and do good for the community, and so on. but then eventually you leave, and according to the nature of your activities, your, your destiny may change. You may even lose the human form of life. No one dies. I, make the, I have this little couplet, you know. Every single body dies, but nobody dies. Wake up, wake up, and open your eyes. You're not that body, you're a pure spirit soul. Chant the holy name and attain life's goal. I forgot that you listened on the, the radio. You probably heard this one ten times already, right? <laughs> it's okay. But, but, but that's, that's the first point. Nobody dies. Najayate mete vakadachin. And that, that completely changes the whole calculation. Because people, people are mostly living as if this is it. I got one chance to enjoy. I better grab this, grab that, you know. I remember, you know, of course, I've been in the movement for almost 50 years now, so I didn't, I, I, when I joined, there wasn't even such a thing known as, well, it was, but it, but it was very rare, cocaine or anything like that, you know. But, but uh, I, I read articles about young people growing up and said, well, I don't want to miss out, you know. I may miss out, so I better try this drug, that drug, you know, this experience, that experience. And you can get, by that bad association, you can get drawn out, down into a very, very dark place. You know, you, you're, you're, in a, you're, in a, you're in an apartment, you know, you're invited in, and then there's a raid, the, the police come, they've been watching the place, and then they got some guy in there who's dealing drugs. You're just swept up in it, and you're, now you're in jail. Right? That's how it works. You were there, you might, you know. It's just craziness. Huh? It can get worse and worse. It can become a nightmare very quickly, you know. So, so good association is all important. Sadhu Sangha, right? Association with saintly people who can give you another idea about how to live and also give you something practical to do where your, your life can open up and blossom into something else. So back to our verse here. This, in this verse, he's, Krishna is saying that that Anashrita karma palam. Okay, not taking shelter of the fruits of your activity, and karma, but performing your duty. That's the real sannyasi and the real yogi. Not someone who doesn't light any fire. In other words, it's not a question of what you're not doing. It's also, it's also that's important. But it's also what you're doing that is the it's going to be the measure of whether you're really making progress or not. So he's saying the real uh, sannyasi and the real yogi whose one is karyam karma karotiya, who's, who's performing his duty, but not hankering for the fruits. In other words, you're working according to your psychophysical nature, you know, to your strengths, but the, your, the, the purpose of your working is for the pleasure of the Lord. And if you make some fruits and you, you dedicate to the, the temple or what, and just, you, you live simply. So that's a real sannyasi. It doesn't mean that, that you carry, you know, he's not saying you carry a danda and you're dressed a certain way, you know, that's formality. But really the essence of it, sannyasi means total renun renunciation. Renunciation of the fruits, because those fruits means that something you'll enjoy yourself, that binds you to this world and ensures your next suffering. You see? In other words, it's a good investment not to enjoy the fruits but rather to, to work for the benefit of the guru, for the benefit of the, uh, of the Lord, in other words, for the, the best service, because we're part and parcel. It's like, that's, that's, our, that's to our own best interest. It's just like the hand, you know, the story, the, 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 the story I forget the Bengali phrase, the, the senses which went on strike. Imagine that the hands and the feet and the, you know, are, are living, intelligent beings, right? So they, they get together and they, they consult. They say, we're doing all this work. The feet are working, walking to work, and the hands are doing all this work, and the, and the money is coming in. We're going to the grocery store. We're buying the, the groceries. We're preparing the food, and then it all goes to the stomach, and the stomach enjoys. And what are we doing? You know, We're going on strike until we can enjoy. So what happens is they, they go on strike. <laughs> you don't remember. There was, there was a play 
a one-man play put on of this, this little pastime right here where I'm sitting. There was this devotee who came from Alancho. I forget his name right now. Uh, something Bushan. And then uh, he put on his play. So visualize there's this table, and there's a bowl of food on the top. And the table has a, a little uh, tablecloth, and so you can't see him. He's underneath. And so the hand is reaching up around the table, and, and he finds the banana, you know? And it, and, it, and it crushes the banana and mushes up the banana, trying to enjoy the banana on its own, right? <laughs> but what can it really enjoy, you know? <laughs> so what happens is the, the hands, the feet, you know, they went on strike. So now there's no food going in the stomach. But then they're all becoming weak because they only prosper from the food and be going in for digesting and making the blood and everything. So they realize that they, they consult after a while, say, oh, we're just dying here. We can't do it. Let's go back to work. So the idea is that we are meant to be like Krishna's hands, right? We, we, for so long, millions of lifetimes, we haven't functioned that way. We rebelled. I like to, I like to quote this first from the 11th Cano. Bayam, because the, the, one of the, the main qualities of, of material life is fear. It may not always be manifest, but there's a, there's a, a general undertow of anxiety because anything can happen. The body is so fragile, socioeconomic condition, the droughts, the, the, the tsunami can come, you know, uh, earthquakes, uh, anything, all the uh, COVID-19. I mean, it's, there's all kinds of things that kind of make you anxious, right? So that's bayam. That comes when we leave the spiritual world. We're in the material world. So what, how did we get to the world? Bayam. asmati. So much, the Bhagavatam is so com, uh, con, condensed, Sanskrit language. So fear arises when the living entity turns away from Krishna in the spiritual world and becomes absorbed in the material world of duality, good and bad. You know, this is now my field of enjoyment, my field of domination. The idea is to try to enjoy independently. But it causes great fear because we've lost touch with the Supreme Lord who is our ultimate protector and security. That's why it's called Vaikuntha. No anxiety at all. Not even a little pinch. Time is eternal. You're, you're, you're very happily serving the Lord and you can go on forever. You know? Nothing goes on forever here. Uh, this, this, this whole world, this whole universe is temporary. So what, then what happens? <clears throat> he explains... Uh, who is this? This is one of the, the, the learned sons of, of uh, Bharat, King Bharat, called the, one of the nine Yogendras. In the early part of the 11th canal, chapter 2 and 3, they each come on the stage, one after another, and give a wonderful lesson in Krishna consciousness. So, he's saying, Yan Mahayata, it all is due to Maya energy, the illusory energy of the Lord. When we turn away from Him, and we're no longer in, uh, in, in, in enwrapped by the internal energy of Krishna, which is the pleasure energy, Srimati Radharani, you know, and which, which uh, inspires us to serve and stay in that. So we lose that connection. Then we're at, at the, uh, in the control of Maya. And Maya's duty is to bewilder us into thinking that we can be happy separate from Krishna and then making us suffer until finally we learn a lesson. So Zen Maya, the, so the Buddha, the intelligent person, Abba J. Tum worships that same Lord that we turned away from eons ago. How? Bhakti Aikayashim, with one pointed, unmotivated, uninterrupted devotional service. Not motivated. And Guru Deva Tapma, seeing one's spiritual preceptor as one's very self and worshipable Lord. In other words, one has to have that connection with Krishna to realize so. So, uh, Krishna is giving us step by step. There's like a yoga ladder here. He's gone through Karma Yoga and then Jnana Yoga. The knowledge, which comes in in, uh, in the fourth chapter especially. And now this uh, karma yoga continues in knowledge in the fifth chapter. And now dhyana yoga. So with karma yoga, jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, and bhakti yoga. And it all culminates in bhakti yoga, which takes elements of each one of those and, and uses it to support the, the process of bhakti yoga. So this chapter will end with a statement of Krishna that the best yogi, is the one who is always thinking with me with great faith and serving, serving me. But before he gets to that point, he's going to give some very important instructions that we all, like for instance, that the mind can be the best friend or the worst enemy of the living being. But the mind that's fixed on Krishna is our best friend. But the mind that's always, you know, pulling you, think of this, do this, try to enjoy this, fear that, it can be your worst enemy. So how can we make the mind our friend? By training it 
in Krishna consciousness. And the best means? Chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, any questions on this first verse? Yes, Prabhu. Krishna. I bow again. So, a yogi, is it, is, it, uh, is it fine to say a yogi is one who is complete within himself? Like, for example, people look for like love affairs, relationships, right? Uh, yeah. Do so much to feel complete, to feel uh, yeah. fully satisfied. Um, but a yogi is satisfied within himself, like because he has tasted a higher, higher taste. Like, you know. Yeah, but, but generally, you know, we can't just say yogi. You have to say what kind of yogi. Yes, you so know. I want to know that. What yeah. kind of yogi? But because because uh, I'll give you a verse from Lord Chaitanya. And Lord Chaitanya is Krishna. So who, who gets real peace? You know, peace that, but, but it says in the, in the Bible, right? The peace that passeth all understanding. Supreme peace. Prabhupada uses that phrase, supreme. So that comes up. We just had it at the end of the fifth chapter. Uh, one who understands that I'm the, I am the enjoyer of all sacrifices, I am the Lord of all worlds, and I am the best friend of every living entity. Suridam Sarvabhutanam. Gyatva, one who really knows that for true, he attains real peace. Now, knowing means if you really know it, then you act on that knowledge. Otherwise, it's just something. So, the, the uh, Krishna, now, now, Lord Chaitanya says, who really attains peace? There's four actual classifications of human beings. Uh, the Bhukti Kamis, Mukti Kamis, Siddhi Kamis, and devotees. So these are all Kamis. Kamis means, you know, not the communists, but the, uh, those who are <laughs> full of karma. Okay? So he says, uh, Krishna Bhakta, Nishkama, Ata eva shanta, bukti mukti siddhi kami sakali ashanta. Very, very instructive. So he says the devotees, because they're nishkama, they have no personal desire left. All of desire sublimated into desire to please the Lord, please the devotees, and like that. You know, but but the others have various degrees of of selfishness, selfish desire. So the bukti kamis are the vast majority. Those are the average people who would just have self-centered or somewhat expanded selfishness. You see. Um, but then there's some who are yogis, but they are mystic yogis, and they do the meditation thing, but they get uh, seduced by the powers that come with that. The different siddhis that Prabhupada mentions, I think, here, or lagima siddhi, mahima siddhi, they be lighter than the lightest, walk on water. Some say that Jesus Christ went to, to the east, studied some yoga, and he's walking on water. And they, Prabhupada tells the story of one of his friends who told his father the story, and he heard it, that uh, early in the, uh, the early part of the, of the 19th century, the British were ruling India. And uh, in Delhi, it's not that far from the Himalayas, so sometimes the yogis would come down, you know, and they would wander around Delhi. So there was this yogi who was in Delhi, and he was naked. They, they go naked, you know. Oh, you can't have that, you know. So they, they arrested him and locked him up. Next morning, he's walking on the street again. What happened? They lock him up, put him in. Next morning, he's walking on the street. He had the anima city. He could get smaller and smaller and get through the keyhole, come out, and then walk in. These are real cities. <laughs> and uh, there are others, you know, reading minds, Houdini may have had some yogic powers to get, you know, get out of the thing. So you can imagine how, and then some of them, you can get anything you want from anywhere. So immediately when I read that, this was before I was at the boat, he said, oh, Fort Knox. You know, I keep all the gold. Is there really any gold in there anymore? I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> you, know, you get what you, gold is so expensive. It's, you know, it's so valuable. I was reading this story of the Syamantaka jewel. This is in the Krishna book, 10th Kano, you know. Everyone says Syamantaka jewel. Siamantaka jewel. So this jewel was producing 170 pounds of gold every day and multiplied it out at the present, present rate, rate as like $133 million every day. You can imagine how enticing that was. And it, there's a lesson there because this is in Dwarka. This is the going on that this, this uh, resident of Dwarka, he became enthralled with this, but he had a good. Uh, relationship with the uh, sun god and the sun god gave him this jewel that you could produce gold 
So he, Krishna said, you should give it to Ugusen. He's the, uh, the king of, of Dwarka. But he refused this Satrajit. And so he was keeping it at home and making all this gold. And, and he gave it, and he had a brother who he loaned it to, and his brother was touting, and he walked out into the, into the forest riding his horse with a big jewel, a very brilliant jewel. But a lion came, killed him, and stole the jewel. And then there was this king of the rickshas, Riksharaj, Jambavan, that he killed the lion, took the jewel, and gave it to his son to play with. So Krishna, uh, so Satrajit, he, you know, he had been poisoned by this desire for the jewel. And so Krishna had told him to give it to Ugrasen. He said, oh, Krishna killed my brother for it. And he started this rumor in Dwarka. So in order to allay that rumor, Krishna went out with some of the residents of, of, of Dwarka. And he found Prasena, who had been killed. Then he found the lion, who had been killed. And then he, he, he knew that Jambavan had taken it. So he went into the, this cave, and he did battle with Jambavan for 28 days. And finally, Jambavan, who's a devotee, he gave him the jewel, gave Krishna the jewel. So th this poor Satrajit, you know, he was so enamored that eventually he was killed. And Krishna gave him back the jewel. And then he was killed by, uh, by some conspirators, and, and all because he got enamored of the material energy. So this is the, yog the yogic cities, the ordinary material kamas, and then there's the mukti cities, mukti kamis. And it's interesting, because this whole idea of liberation, which is part of our motivation for practicing bhakti in the first stages. Listen, you're an eternal person, the jayate mirite vakadachan, you know? But you're, but you're suffering old age, disease, and death. You've been doing it for millions of births. So to get liberation, you practice bhakti yoga, go back to God, and no more birth and death. So this is an important uh, uh, you know, allurement or, or motivation to take up bhakti. I'll, I'll take it up. But the point is, when you take up bhakti yoga, your, your, your desires change. It's a transformation. And at a certain point, like here he said, I don't care about liberation anymore. Because you're, you're not suffering anymore, you're, you're enjoying uh, exchanging, you know, loving exchanges with Krishna through service. And uh, what you want is to somehow serve Krishna in any circumstance, even in this material world. You know, let me stay here and preach Krishna consciousness, you know, as long as I can chant Hare Krishna. So that's an ev evolution, you see. But, the, but the, the, uh, those who are mukti kamis, they don't go through that evolution. They want liberation without Krishna consciousness, impersonal. You know? And it's, it's practically impossible to even get a, get a, simul, a, sim, a simulacrum of, of liberation. But there's a verse like that. I quoted this verse several times already. The demigods are praying to Krishna in the womb. He said, besides the devotees, there are others who think they're liberated, uh, but their, their intelligence is impure because they're not devotees. And they try to go up to the Brahman, impersonal Brahman, by severe austerities. You have, to, you have to use your will to control the senses, control the mind, and in this way come to the point of basically not thinking of anything. And then you're able to get to the uh, Br Brahman. But that's not our natural position, to be in the impersonal Brahman. Our natural position is to have our spiritual body and to be in Goloka Vrindavan or Vaikuntha serving Krishna. So they eventually fall down. Aruha Krishna Param Padang. Param Padang means the transcendental platform. Patantyado. Patantyado means fall down. Anadrita Yushmarangriya, because they are averse to serving your lotus feet. So the whole point is, is that. Uh, we don't, want to, we don't want to be diverted. And your, your question about, about the, the yogis uh, is that you have to define what, what kind of yogi it is. Is it a bhakti yogi or is it a uh, mystic yogi? So when we practice Krishna consciousness, we call ourselves bhakti yogis? Bhakti yogis. Okay. Bhakti yogis. Bhakti yogis. We still want to be linked up. The whole yoga means to link. But we want to be linked up to the Supreme, who is ultimately a person, in love. Not just in th thought. Thought is also there, but, uh, but ultimately it, it awakens our pure love. All right, should we go on? Okay. Yang sannyasa mati prahu. Yang sannyasa mati prahu. Yogam tam vidhi pandava. Yogam tam vidhi pandava. Naya sannyasta sankalpo. Naya sannyasta sankalpo. Yogi bhavati kashchana. 
What is called renunciation, you should know to be the same as yoga, or linking oneself with the Supreme, O son of Pandu. For one can never become a yogi unless he renounces the desire for sense gratification. So, a real yoga uh, presupposes sannyas. Means that sannyas means uh, total renunciation of sense gratification. As Prabhupada says, purport real sannyas, yoga or bhakti means that one should know his constitutional position as the living entity and act accordingly. The living entity has no separate independent identity. He is the marginal energy of the Supreme. When he is entrapped by material energy, he is conditioned. And when he is Krishna conscious or aware of the spiritual energy, then he is in his real and natural state of life. Therefore, when one is in complete knowledge, one ceases all material sense gratification or renounces all kinds of sense gratificatory activities. This is practiced by the yogis who restrain the senses from material attachment. But a person in Krishna consciousness has no opportunity to engage his senses in anything which is not for the purpose of Krishna. Therefore, a Krishna conscious person is simultaneously a sannyasi and a yogi. The purpose of knowledge and of restraining the senses as described in the, uh, as prescribed in the jnana and yoga processes, is automatically served in Krishna consciousness. If one is unable to give up the activities of his selfish nature, then jnana and yoga are of no avail. The real aim is for a living entity to give up all self selfish satisfaction and to be prepared to satisfy the Supreme. A Krishna conscious person has no desire for any kind of self-enjoyment. He is always engaged for the enjoyment of the Supreme. One who has no information of the Supreme must therefore be engaged in his self-satisfaction because no one can stand on the platform of inactivity. All purposes are perfectly served by the practice of Krishna consciousness. And, and here you again, again, you get you know, this paradoxical view. He has no, uh, no, no desire for any kind of self-enjoyment. But then we learn that the greatest enjoyment is to serve Krishna. Right, it's to love Krishna. It, it says, there's a, a wonderful verse again in the 11th canon, again by the yoga, nine yogendas. Bhakti padeshana bhavo viraktir anyata chaisha trika eka kala papadyamanasa yatashna taksu tushti pushti chadapayo anugasa. So he's saying that what, this is the, what, what uh, bhakti results in. So one who is truly surrendered to the Lord, papadyamanas, is engaging in bhakti. Uh, bhakti para isha anubhavo virakta anyata cha. Prabhupada would quote that. So, so bhakti itself is the uh, exchange of mellows with the Lord. So there's pleasure there. And para isha anubhava, a direct experience of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And those two things uh, are accompanied by virakta anyata cha, detachment from everything else uh, for the surrendered soul. Uh, Bhakti Anyata Chai Trika Eka Kala. They occur pretty simultaneously. Prabhadyaman Yatashna Yata, just as if someone is sitting. I like to give you the example of uh, Nishringadev's appearance day because it's a nice big feast, but it happens pretty late at uh, moonrise, so maybe 7 30, 8 o'clock. You know. So it was a fast day until then. So by the time the kirtans and all the offerings are over, then you're ready for a nice feast. Krishna Prasadam, to honor a nice feast. So you sit down and there's, you know, this wonderfully prepared sabji and the puris and there may be some kachoris and, oh, you know, this is, okay. And you start eating, oh. And every you see tushti. You explain tushti means satisfaction. You know, you've, you're, you've been, you've fasted all day, you know. And also, uh, so there's, there's pleasure with each bite and pushti means uh, nourishment of the body. And with each bite, Chodapaso and Agasam, your uh, desire for the food is also going away. So you're detached. You're deta you become detached from, the, from that food, and you're certainly detached from everything else when you're taking the feast. So it's like that, that uh, one who is, is experiencing Krishna consciousness, moment to moment, you're conscious of the Lord, you're performing some service, Whatever you're doing, even if you're walking from point A to point B, you're kind of, oh, I'm doing that because at the end of this, I'm going to do some service for Krishna. So this is also service. In other words, so you're always in the... <laughs> and and it's, it's a constant a sense of happiness. Just like Ambarish, you know. 
whatever he said, talked, he was always talking about Krishna. With his hands, he's cleaning the temple. With his uh, eyes, he's, you know, with his uh, money, he's buying stuff. You know, in other words, everything is engaged. And so he's in uh, complete happiness all the time. So, so, but, his, but it's not self-centered. It's always thinking of, of the Lord. But we have to always remember, we are part and parcel of Krishna. He's Ananda Maya means that he's always in bliss. When we participate in that bliss by giving our little contribution, you know, which he allows us to do, then we can also experience the same happiness because we're part and parcel of him. Just like the, the hands enjoy when they feed the stomach. If they neglect to do that, then they, they, they atrophy. So we're in an atrophied state. We're not in a natural state. We're, we're, we're imprisoned within a material body which is restricting us tremendously. But it's a human body, so therefore it's the fortunate enough we can use our intelligence and then engage our senses in the service of Krishna and perfect it. And it all depends on chanting purely, cleansing the mind, cleansing the heart, cleansing the intelligence and the senses, you know. So we should take up the chanting seriously. All right, any comments, questions on text two? Oh, Bhakta Bob. Hare Krishna. Thank you for that very nice discourse. Um, I'm kind of confused here, um, and uh, I'm sure it's simple, but it says uh, the living entity has no separate identity. He is a marginal energy of the Supreme. Yeah. Can you break that down for me? <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're not an individual. We learned that way back in chapter 2. Krishna says, never was the time that I did not exist, nor you nor all these fighters and kings. And in the future, we will continue to exist. Or well, Prabhupada likes to quote 15.7. Uh, Mama eva angsha jiva loka jiva bhuta sanatana. Mama eva angsha. Angsha means a little particle, like a drop of uh, ocean water or a sun ray. That's our relation. Krishna is the sun with the sun ray. Krishna is the ocean with the drop. So we, we always have our individuality, but can you really say the sun ray is separate from the sun? It depends completely on the sun. So that's what he means here. Maybe the, the separate identity is an is a independent identity. Separate independent identity. So we're, we're Krishna's energy. You know, we have no existence if he didn't exist, we wouldn't exist like that. We're completely dependent. But our identity or our um, true nature is one of being uh, participating in, in Krishna's uh, pastimes and with a certain uh, you know, form, qualities, you know, identity. So in that sense, we're separate. This is the inconceivable, as you know, achincha, beta, beta, tattva. Achincha beta beta means inconceivably different, but non-different at the same time. How can that be? It's inconceivable, but that's where we are. We're one in the sense that we're one in quality, but we're separate in that we have our, our, our minute independence. You know, we have Krishna's quality of independence, but a minute degree. That means we can exercise it to try to imitate him and try to be separate from him. But where has it gotten us? Millions of births in this material world, a lot of suffering. So our, our, our natural uh, 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 and, and, and most um, wholesome activity that we, and, that we can do is to act in accord with Christian desires, you see, but maintaining our own identity. We're not going to merge. We don't want to merge and lose our identity. That's, that's uh, kaivalyam narakayate. That's hellish. Because as soon as you merge, there's no bhakti anymore. You know? So we maintain our identity as Krishna wants and we engage in our own specific service in one of the, one of the rasas, the servanthood, friendship, like that. And that, that's there for eternity. So that's what Krishna's meant here. No separate independent identity. We have our, our, our dependent identity. Yeah, yeah, we're completely dependent on Krishna. So there's no separate independent identity. All right, we have time for one more. Arudukshomane yogam, karma karana muchati, yoga rudhasya tasyaiva, samak karana muchati. For one who is a neophyte in the Eightfold Yoga system, work is said to be the means. 
And for one who is already elevated in yoga, cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. Purport. The process of linking oneself with the Supreme is called yoga. It may be compared to a ladder for attaining the topmost spiritual realization. The ladder begins from the lowest material condition of the living entity and rises up to perfect self-realization in pure spiritual life. According to the various elevations, different parts of the ladder are known by different names. But all in all, the complete ladder is called yoga and may be divided into three parts, namely jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, and bhakti yoga. The beginning of the ladder is called yoga rurukshu stage, and the highest ring is called yoga rudha. Concerning the Eightfold Yoga System, attempts in the beginning to enter into the meditation enter med into meditation through regular principles of life and practice of different sitting postures, which are more or less bodily exercises, are considered fruit of material activities. All such activities lead to achieving perfect mental equilibrium to control the senses. When one is accomplished in the practice of meditation, he ceases all disturbing mental activities. A Krishna conscious person, however, is situated from the beginning on the platform of meditation because he, is, he always thinks of Krishna. And, be, and being constantly engaged in the service of Krishna, he is considered to have ceased all material activities. So Krishna consciousness, you know, how, how could it... Uh, I mean, when, you, when you, real, you study or you review how it spread and what was the context... So I was there, you know, near the beginning. I mean, I, I joined in 73, but I was, took up yoga in uh, 70 in New York. And the devotees were, you know, they, they, was, they think they were still there. They, uh, maybe they had moved to 68 Second Avenue, or maybe they were just in Brooklyn. But there were all the, you know, people were taking up yoga. They were start, starting Hatha Yoga. And, but there was very little talk or very un understanding of any transcendental purpose of it. It was all, you know, to become very healthy and peaceful and wholesome, you know, like that. Which was attractive, you know, to, to, to me anyway. There was a certain cohort that was attractive to. But there was, I don't recall much of any kind of transcendental, you know, element. Of course, there was something called transcendental meditation. That was a big thing. And I think they're still going on. But this whole idea of... of uh, a whole new identity, a whole new world, uh, the importance of escaping birth and death. And, you know, I mean, the Bhagavad Gita, I remember reading the Bhagavad Gita, but it wasn't explained like this. I didn't come away from it, you know, with any understanding. What should I do? You know, because the person who wrote it wasn't it translated, it wasn't a bhakta. Although the, it's, it's quite evident, you know, at the end, Krishna says, man mana bhava man bhakto. You know, here's the most confidential knowledge, here's the essence of the whole thing. Think of me. You know, become devoted to me, become a bhakta, mudjaji, worship me and bow down to me, then you'll come to me. And then he says this radical thing, all right, everything I taught you, forget it. <laughs> Sarva dharma padajaja. All these dharmas, I mean, just forget that, you don't need all that. Just surrender unto me. I'll protect you from all reactions, do not fear. And how to surrender? The previous verse. Think of me, become my devotee. Now, the, the, the art and science of devotion has been... Um, you know, developed and enunciated in the most detail and practical thing by the followers of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for this age. All the processes, you know, the, the, the do's and the don'ts, and it's been not laid out. So that's the culmination of the Gita. It's all one science. And, and even in the, in the Bhagavatam also ends in that, in the last part of the Bhagavatam. The very last verse talks about Nam Sankirtan, believe it or not, of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Nama Sankhana says, yeah, I forget how the verse goes. So all, all of the, the, this yoga ladder ultimately comes up to the, the level of bhakti yoga. And this Krishna will explain it here in the 12th chapter, you know. Is that, the, 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 Arjuna asks, well, which is the best? Which is really practical? Is it the one who is meditating on the impersonal form or your bhakti? says, it's the bhakta. So we're in the, in the, right, we're in the right movement. <laughs> All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Haribo. So we'll resume tomorrow.